What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Champion Living Podcast, where we believe that consistency, perseverance, and not taking life too seriously are the keys to success. I'm Doug, the founder and owner and head coach of Champion Living Fitness. Each week, I'll be joined by my coaching staff with the vision of providing trustworthy information about fitness, nutrition, and mindset, and how this all applies to being a professional rodeo athlete, as well as people from all walks of life. Are you ready to become a champion? Let's go. I guess what she's talking about, but she was like a super competitive chick. She was on team. She made the games. She always, I think, struggled with loading, quote unquote, not being able to get as lean as she wanted to be or whatever. And like what it came down to was almost an exercise addiction, like Mm -hmm. to the game of CrossFit or sport of CrossFit, which led to OTS, overtraining syndrome. And you do that for years on years on years on years and you really mess yourself up not just like mentally but internally there are so many things that you have to redo so i was just reading her post and she was talking about you know she's got she's really good at those hooks getting people hooked in she's like i'll never do crossfit again because and then it's like a much more moderate view of how she views fitness now she just had a baby like she just so it's just kind of cool to see and i kind of been talking about how I was trying out those high intensity workouts again. I did about three weeks of that and quickly am realizing why I don't do that anymore. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) And it's just not sustainable for the average human, man. If that is your sport and that is your game and that is all you do, heck yeah. But the reason I say that is because you have to have so much time for the accessory work that has to go along with that. Yes. So much stuff has to be dialed in in order to to make it happen like and able to to just be able to sustain those those types of workouts really yeah dude so i have been feeling like a hot pile of trash lately this week last even starting into last week i was like what is going on my body is aching my necks and shoulders freaking hurt my hips hurt my knees hurt everything hurts and i haven't felt i honestly have never felt that like this kind of joint pain and i'm like what is going on well I look back and I'm like, okay, you increase your intensity a lot and your volume. You did not do any more accessory work. You probably did less because I was whooped from doing it and just felt good, you know, riding kind of those endorphins. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden accumulation sets in and I got a problem. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You probably, I'm assuming, but you didn't, but did you like change your nutrition at all at that time? Or I did increase more attention. it a little bit. I needed to increase it a lot more than what I did. Yeah. And I think that's a huge part of it. And so, Have you stepped on the scale like since you started feeling no, trashy? No, I haven't stepped on the scale, man, in a long, long time. I don't even have a scale at the house. So I don't know what my weight is. I don't feel like I look super lean or anything. Like I don't feel like I've lost a bunch of weight or anything. But I would have if I kept pushing it for sure. Mm. And it would have been going down a, the avenue I don't really want to. It's not The whole point of fitness, again, for me... Is I just want to feel good and do the stuff I want to do. And here I am three weeks out from going hunting and I'm like, what? I cannot feel like this in three weeks. This is not good. And so lucky for me, I've been here before and (laughs) get it. And so I quickly went to deload. And so Mm -hmm. I've been doing nothing but two sets of banded exercises, like super easy. Body's already feeling a lot better. Woke up this morning. My neck and shoulders, like my traps, have been killing me. And I think that's where I carry a lot of my stress too. So when I get a little wound tight, I Mm -hmm. just constantly flex in my traps. And dude, the last few days have been killing me. And so I've been really crushing the iron neck in the mornings and getting my traps moving, getting my scabs moving. Did a bunch of banded mobility for shoulders, lats, just the whole pecs. Like everything that's connected to there is attached to that neck right and so i just did the 360 approach and got it all moving this morning and i can't tell you how much better i feel right now Mm -hmm. compared to even 20 minutes ago i just got done doing it and they're having coffee i have to go do something because this is not gonna work for any part of the day today and yeah movement's medicine like you get things moving get things firing again it's crazy how much better you feel and you know, I just think of all the people that have aches and pains like this, like your neck or your shoulders or whatever, and you avoid movement because you think it's going to make it worse. And so you just continue to do that. And all you had to do was 
go put in a little movement. Hmm. What's new in your life, dude? Yeah, man. Uh, well, I guess kind of keep it on the same track is like my plan is kind of similar to what yours was there this morning. Just kind of get, take care of some of the aches and pains in the gym and stuff. Last night was my first good night's sleep on my own bed in like a week. I've been sleeping on a futon for the last five days. And yesterday, driving home, we had a 12 hour drive. And man, my neck was just like, Crushed. help me. Yeah. yeah, just <laughs> screaming. And so that's exactly what's on on the the plan for today maybe some super light like hypertrophy style stuff after i take mm-hmm. care of the prehab and just get things going through full ranges of motion and and taking care of taking care of that stuff but yeah you know we talk a lot about or we have recently kind of like about progressive overload well i mean heck we talk about that all the t- since the existence of this show we have talked about progressive overload mm-hmm. but you know we talk about the traditional ways of increasing the weight, increasing the volume, you know, over the weeks that go on throughout the program. What we don't talk about, and I kind of, and this kind of led me into it is this feeling I'm having of, I went too hard. I wasn't ready. My body's pissed. I'm going to do this active recovery week. And then where am I going? And I immediately think of, okay, I still want to get better. I still want to get stronger, but I don't necessarily want to increase the volume or increase my, my weights right now. Mm -hmm. So two things that I can focus on to change that load are isometrics and tempo work, essentially eccentric tempo is kind of what we are going to talk about today. Um, but these two things, man, are so underrated, I think in training programs, because they, in my eyes, the most bang for your buck. Yeah. And and they probably look the most boring. Like it was boring. They're the simplest things ever. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you know when you tell someone to move slower, they're like, yeah. "Why would I do that?" It's, yeah, I'm trying to work easy. out. I'm trying to sweat. Why would I move slower? Or why would yeah. I hold this pose? <laughs> like, and then it they seems do try it. Exactly. It's so funny how much of it is counterintuitive. You're like, "No, that makes no sense." Then you do it. You're like, "Whoo, that was spicy. Mm-hmm. That got my attention big time." You know, so. We're going to talk about eccentric training, isometrics, how to add them into your program, how we use them with our athletes, how we use them with ourselves. Uh, Let's dive into it right now. So let's start with some definitions, just basic stuff here. Isometric training. This involves holding a muscle contraction without changing its length. So a lunge hold. You get down into this lunge position, the bottom of it, with your knee just slightly off the ground, your back knee, knees are at 90 degrees, chest, torso, completely vertical lockdown core and we're holding that lunge position for as long as possible or something simple like a plank or a wall sit whatever whatever isometric you want something that is holding still and not changing the length of that muscle we just did common exercises for that as well what is what are some other ones hollow Um, holds would be a good one yeah hollow holds and those are all like i i don't remember what they there's another style of isometrics that I like to incorporate as well. The, the, these ones, I think they're called yielding isometrics, maybe where you're just holding that, that position, but like, those are really great for beginners. And then like, as you progress doing things like overcoming isometrics where you're press, like you're actually applying force into an immovable. And so like, then you can, you can really vary up the exercises like um, a lateral hip drive into the wall kind of deal. Right. Exactly. Or, you okay. know, a wall drive, like just hands on the wall, like for pressing into the wall, you can do it with like deadlifts. You can put pins on your deadlift rack and you can pull up into it. You can do it with squats. You can, Ooh, you can pretty cool. much add in any exercise that you would normally do. And you're just applying force in a position where you're not going to be able to move it. So like, that's just another way to add in variety to, to isometric training. Dude, I love those examples. And that's something that I forget about all the time because I am usually just stuck on the the simple things, right? Mm -hmm. But as we advance as athletes, those kinds of variations are so fun. And they they target something that you never do in your normal training. And like those deadlifts, putting the, you know, like the racks on over it. So you're pulling into the rack when you're pulling Mm -hmm. up and as you're at a halting, you're stuck and you're just pulling through that. Whew. Yeah. It's awesome. I love that. Those are great examples. So for rodeo athletes, isometrics are so, so important. And I had a 
one of my really good friends. He's a physical therapist. His name's Justin Bickford. I don't think we've had him on the show before. We should. We probably should. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's awesome. He's in the Houston area. If you guys need anything PT related and you need his contact, just let us know. He's the man to go see, but he, any kind of sprains or strains isometrics are going to be the number one thing that we do to overcome those. So, you know, whether you strained your quad or strained your groin or whatever it is, isometric exercises are our first step. We want to get to holding that position and getting that muscle active again, and then we can move on from there. But in my hip flexors, man, I'd pull a hip flexor a lot when I was rodeoing and getting on bucking horses and I pro- it felt like I ripped it off the bone the last time I got on or when I started getting back on a few years ago, oh, a few years ago, shit, this COVID. So that's almost five years ago, <laughs> right? Long time ago. But I remember going in there, Justin being like, it's a grade two s- strain, sprain, whatever it is, as close as you can get to, to ripping it. He's like, but it's not torn. Like you need to do these exercises every day. And when, when it's healed, like when it feels better you're doing three or four sets now, just make sure you do at least two sets twice a week and maintain that throughout. And so I've done these hip flexor isometric holds forever and they, I feel great. But the crazy thing is when I stop doing them and I go to do like an active straight leg raise or something, that thing will pop every single time I lift my leg. But if I maintain it with the resistance bands twice a week, no popping feels Mm -hmm. great. So you rodeo athletes, this is going to help really enhance that stability throughout those joints, which in our sport, we need to be very, very stable. It also is going to help balance is the first, the thing I don't think about when I'm doing these, it's the first thing I feel when I get into them usually, especially these, you know, isometric or isolateral, unilateral, sorry, exercises one leg or one arm at a time. Like, like, Oh wow. And I'm usually balanced better on one foot than the other, Mm -hmm. which is kind of weird. Well, because a lot of times like what you're doing is you're moving through a range of motion. So like you have, like, you know what the bottom position should look like and you can get there and then you know what the top should look like and you can get there. But like when you're holding that middle or that bottom position, like it really challenges like the stabilizer muscles that are, that are usually they're working, you know, when you're going through those moments or those movements, but there's never quite that emphasis on that hold. And so like it really, really, it kind of wakes the, it wakes you up a little bit and, and to find where you're deficient. And one of the other things that I like about isometrics is it helps you learn movement patterns a lot faster because you get that feedback of like, Oh crap. Now I'm really wobbly right here. So I'm, I'm probably overcompensating in some way to, to get, get through the movement. And so that's why I love them so much for beginners too, because it, it's one really hard Two, it's, it helps really hard in the sense that it's so simple that it's yeah hard. yeah it's like <laughs> it, you over you underestimate the difficulty and then it helps them learn movement patterns really really fast and w- one of the the other benefits and we might get into this when we talk about eccentrics is there's a lot less muscle damage so you're not going to feel near as sore and i think that's why it, one of the reasons why it works so well in in like rehab settings is we're not we're not creating more damage mm-hmm. to the muscles or the ligaments we're just challenging them in a way that's going to, to overall help them recover better. Yeah, absolutely, man. They're, they're awesome. So, so easy that they're difficult. Yeah. And I love, it's a, it sets the foundation, man. If you're stable through your joints and you're stable in those bottom positions of those movements, especially like a squat or a lunge or split squat, whatever deadlift, Mm -hmm. you are going to be so much better at moving. You're going to get so much more out of each rep that you do. You know, rodeo athletes, this is something that you need to be doing. General population, moms, dads, guys, girls just want to be badasses everyday life. You definitely need to be doing isometrics. They are mm-hmm. a must throughout all stages of life. What's um, something too, like, especially like the bigger joints, like shoulders and hips and stuff is like, it does improve mobility. And, and that's not something that I necessarily thought about talking about, but I was just thinking through anytime I go train somewhere like public, cause I work out at home almost every day. But anytime I go train somewhere public, like when I went to, went to a weightlifting competition or OPAs, like people will watch me squat and they're like, Oh man, you have like really insane hip mobility. Like I wish mine was like that. I'm like, well, what you hey, didn't girl, see, how you get that? Thing yeah, down there. what you didn't see <laughs> was the 14 years prior to today yes. of me holding the bottom of a squat, like mm-hmm. really, like trying to focus on on gaining control over that movement. And and isometrics are a big piece you know of that puzzle. You can make such a good story off of that. Be like, yeah, I've been holding the bottom of a squat, you know, for 20 years. My family was so broke when we grew up. We didn't have a toilet. We just yeah, no, but that's that's spot on, man. It really does increase your mobility and 
we're going to talk about eccentrics too, but I really love eccentrics for just everything it does for your mobility, your movement. It's, it's my favorite real quick, incorporating isometrics into a training routine or something. If someone's already training, how do we put these in? They're super easy to throw in. I love to throw them in warm ups. They mm-hmm. are great, great place to do them. You can do them your cool downs as well. Again, they're very low intensity exercises. So even if you worked out, you can do these and still get a great benefit. And it also kind of just reestablishes that um, stability in those joints after you've just worked out. Yep. So do it. And also it could be your, I'm walking by my bands and I just have five minutes. It doesn't take long. Mm-hmm. Just go do them and you'll see that you'll see benefits quickly. Yeah. I like them um, in the warm up, and then I like them as an accessory too. So like I say, say I'm accessory. doing lunges. We used the lunge example earlier. Say I have like walking lunges or split squats in my main workout. I'm going to probably throw some in my warm up, and then I'm probably going to throw some more isometric lunge holds or isometric split squats or something in as an accessory as well, because I've, then I've already got that my muscles are already burning from the main workout. And now I'm just getting to challenge them a little bit further and kind of hone in on, again, just fortifying that movement pattern so that my body is going to remember that and, and move really well the next time I come back. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool way to make like, most people will say super set, but you could do like a walking lunge with an isometric hold right after that would be mm-hmm. a burner. Yeah. But like a compound set or complex set, which is alternating muscle group so i do say i was doing a lunge workout i would usually have some kind of i like to pair presses so some kind of other muscle group that is opposite it's just how i set my workouts up some people like to do legs only or push pull or whatever but i would do like a split squat and then i would go to like a single arm overhead hold would be my isometric Mm -hmm. and then I would do a lunge hold as my isometric for my bottom portion. And then I would be doing like a Z press or an Arnold press as my working portion of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's so many ways you can do this and plug these in. You also get creative, but also don't, there aren't that many rules. <laughs> so just do them and you'll yeah, see. Play around with it. That, that's like the same thing goes like with like, as far as like adding them into a cool down, like that's a, a great place to explore a little bit. Like, there's no there's no real like hard fast rules like just find a position that you think is challenging or or you want to get better in and and go with it yep absolutely we get so locked down into the it has to be this way or that way and we said it before but there's this is all gray area there's mm-hmm. like a few things that are black and white but the rest is gray so fire from the hip and see what works not really just get but <laughs> eccentrics let's get into this because this is i could not recommend something more to anybody training than eccentric training. And the reason that I do this is because most people just don't add any kind of tempo to their workouts, their exercises. And that's not, that's just because they don't know what it is. It's not a common thing that has been used in most realms of fitness until recently. We're starting to see it become a big thing. When I got certified through OPEX, man, they were like the only people teaching that. And it made a lot of sense to me because when we add a tempo, and guys, what we're talking about with tempo is eccentric means going down the down portion of a movement. We talked about the isometric, the portion that you're holding in the bottom or the top, depending on where we're at in the plane of movement. And the concentric is either the going up or the standing up, whatever it is. We only, we don't ever train much more than one second in each one of those tempos or in portions of the lift, right? And so when we start adding time to these portions such as eccentric on the way down the lengthening phase of the muscle we are adding time under tension which Mm -hmm. is adding stress which is a that's the whole point of exercising and doing (laughs) resistance training right is to create stress on the muscles we can create a large amount of stress with less weight which Mm -hmm. is cool why don't you kind of explain what's happening during that phase as far as how do I want to word this? Like the the muscle lengthening and like a, like going down. Yeah, I kind of touched on that, but like, yeah, go go with that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess kind of to to paint the picture is like our muscles are elongating during the eccentric phase, and then they're and during the contraction or the concentric phase, they're getting shorter, and so like that's the squeeze. And so again eccentrics are really good for beginners because as those muscles are elongating you can use much lighter weights you can increase that time under tension and we're we're further 
like creating that foundation of like having good movement patterns. You're also like with the, the time under tension, like we're driving more adaptation with less weight, less volume. You know, we don't have to go, you know, you see, everybody sees the guys on Instagram, like lifting, you know, a thousand pounds. And it's like, well, like, yeah, he, that's, he can do that now, but that's not what took him there. So like what we can start now with you to get that same um, amount of intensity in your workout is to slow things down in mm-hmm. the eccentric portion. Hui has the best gear because it's tough. It's durable. It withstands the test of what we put it through. And that is why I am a big supporter of Hui brands. Guys, from hats, apparel, whatever you need, they've got you covered. They are the perfect blend of rodeo style and athletic performance. You can check them out at huibrands.com. Use our discount code Champion Living. All one word is going to save you a little bit at checkout. Hey guys, we got some exciting news for you. If you're listening to this, we know that you're committed to upping your game in the arena. And we're teaming up with the Rodeo Now app to help you do just that. The Rodeo Now app allows you to record, upload, and catalog your rides and runs, review your performances in slow motion. And our favorite feature, if you're not familiar with your stock draw, you can search your animal by name to get all the intel you need to make your next ride a winning one. Join the Rodeo Revolution today and download the Rodeo Now app for free. It's available in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Absolutely. And when it comes to learning a movement, there's no better way than to go slow and master that technique and form. Because the thing about, well, kind of anything. So if you go slow in the beginning and master the form, all the things that you want, like the weight and the muscles and all that, will come naturally because Mm -hmm. you are moving well and executing the movement perfectly. If I'm going to go in the gym and work, I want each rep to to count essentially. I want to get the most out of each rep and tempo is the best way in my eyes to make sure we're doing that until we are proficient at moving through exactly. that movement, right? Yeah. So, go ahead, sorry. Well, I think I've told this story before, but it's been a while, but like when I learned how to deadlift and you know, I'd been working out for a long time before I ever got the courage to even learn how to deadlift because everything we were ever told was like, Oh, you're going to have a bad back. If oh, you deadlift, same, it's man. horrible for you. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then, you know, you kind of dive into it a little bit and it's like, well, actually that's one of the best ways to fortify your back and, and prevent further issues down the road is to, is to deadlift with, with like with using your head, like be smart about it. You can't just put 500 pounds on the bar and rip it. If you're, if you've never done it before, but that, so like, that's how I learned was I, I put 135 pounds on the bar, something I knew I could handle. And then I just slowed it down like super slow. And I started with the eccentric portion. And then eventually I built up to where I was slowing down the concentric portion too. But that is, that is much more difficult. So like if, mm-hmm. if you're just starting out, don't, don't slow that part down. We're not talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But like I would do like, I started with like a three second eccentric on my deadlifts and then I move it to a five before ever adding more weight onto the bar. Mm -hmm. And I probably did that for months. And then once I could video myself from the side and I'm like, my movement pattern is, is proficient. That's when I started adding weight. And so Mm -hmm. I I, I took it slow and you know, now I, I can, I, I don't have like a huge deadlift. It's not like my greatest lifts or anything, but I can do it with confidence that I'm not going to injure myself. How much you deadlift? I don't know. I've, I've, I've the most I've ever done is all the weight that I have in my gym and it's like 360 pounds or something. Okay. But well, I can, I can do more right than that. That 98% of the guys listening probably can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> do it well, but what I was hearing from your stories, man, like everything that you did there, you gained confidence through, mm-hmm. you got, way more confident at doing the thing and dude deadlift for me especially when i had my back surgery oh everyone was like absolutely not you cannot you'll never do that again nope 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 well it is the best thing i've ever done is learn how to do it correctly and like you were talking you used 135 forever i was scared so i used a barbell for a long time and then i used 95 pounds and then i got to 135 i don't think i lifted one over one over 135 for like eight months after being cleared and just mastered the movement. And what I found was it wasn't dangerous. I was freaking weak. Mm -hmm. I was really weak in the areas that were needed to be proficient at deadlift. So like you said, I added an eccentric tempo. Like you said, three seconds is funny because that's what we did too. Three, zero, one, zero, three seconds down, zero seconds in the bottom, one second up, zero seconds at the top. That zero seconds at the top, everyone's like, what's that mean? It means that you're just squeezing your butt and going right back down into Mm -hmm. the lift. It's deadlift is one of the best lifts you could do period as long as you're executing correctly and if you're scared to do it hire a coach you don't know where to find a coach you can chat with us 
visit the website, championleaguefitness.com, click the sign up now button, free consultation, boom. All right, back to our regular schedule program. <laughs> yeah, but adding these tempos is the best way you can be become more proficient at, at your any movement, man. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because think about spur board or the drop barrel. When we tell them to slow down, we're essentially adding like a tempo of some form to it. And I first thing I'm relate to is bareback riders on the spur board. When they're bringing their feet, we get to those schools. First few times on it, or few first few guys get on it, and they mark it out, and it's like rip, 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 rip as fast as they can. And so we stop. I don't want your feet to come off of that board for five seconds. I want you to drag it out for five seconds. And what we're really doing is just establishing proper mechanics over those five seconds. There's no way in hell they're going to be able to do that on a live horse. Mm -hmm. But it's slow down before you can go fast. You have to get the foundation. And that's where these eccentrics and isometrics are going to help you so much. As far as incorporating these into a routine, what would... I think it's very simple to incorporate them. Just start yeah, just adding slow them. Slow down. <laughs> you can <laughs> use them on any lift. It does not matter. Like they're use um, lighter weights is where I'm gonna say to start. Yeah. Like lighten it way up because what you think you can do is probably way less. And first time I ever did tempo and was prepared enough to do it and know what I was doing. And it was a two, 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 one back squat. So two seconds down, two second hold, two seconds up, two uh, one second reset at the top. I was like, at the time I was probably back squatting like 325, something like that. So I threw on 135 and it was eight to 10 reps. So two, 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 six seconds of tension, eight to 10 reps. That's almost a minute of back squatting, right? Mm -hmm. Start looking at it like that. You're like, Ooh, Oh, I found out that 135 got real, real hot at about six reps. And I was sitting there going, what am I doing? Next rep dropped it down to 115. It's still too much. Dropped it down to 95. Honestly, Still too much. Went to 75. And that's where I stayed. So I'm a, that's a guy that could squat 325 pounds. Again, not a huge squat. I was just coming back from my injuries. But 325 to 75, like the ratio of weight differences is, is massive when mm-hmm. we start thinking about that. So when you guys and girls are looking at these movements and you're looking at the weights maybe you did prior with no tempo, it's something as simple as like a, a shoulder press. Well, add a two second tempo that I'd probably knock off 15 or 20 pounds to start because you mm-hmm. can always go up and yeah, you can always go down, but I'd rather go up than have to go down. Yeah. And it's great. The, uh, another way to, in- when to incorporate it would be like, if like for me, for instance, having a home gym, like I don't have a giant selection of weights. I have dumbbells that go up to 50 pounds. I've only got 360 pounds I can put on the bar. So it's like, I'm going to run out of room eventually to get to drive adaptation. Like I'm not going to get the same tension that I want. And so like, you know, I might go through a block where I'm starting at 10 to 12 reps and I'll work my way down at like a two second eccentric portion. And so, you know, by the end I'm, I'm lifting pretty heavy at at four reps at going two seconds. Well, now I, I don't have much more room to go because I have no more weight to add to the bar. So I'll just go back to the top. I'll start back at 12 reps now in my next block and I'll add a second in the eccentric portions. Now mm-hmm. I'm starting, now I'm doing three second eccentrics. And so that's another way that we can add that progressive overload. If you don't have more weights to throw on the bar. And a lot of times you don't need to throw more weights on the bar, especially yeah. as an athlete, like sometimes strong enough is strong enough. And so like, let's just go back to the basics and, and slow things down and just get better at what you can currently do. Dude. I love that. You said that that strong enough is strong enough. This is a little off topic, but when we start talking about strength and athletes, like I think most people think of, the word strength and they go right to like a football player, linebacker, a big dude. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because each sport is a different level of strong enough. And that is different for everybody, just depending on what they do, what event they do, what position they play. If they play one, like it all, it all comes into individualization Mm -hmm. and for rodeo athletes, strength training comes up, resistance training comes up and they shy away because they think of that big guy. But all we're doing with resistance training here, y'all is trying to make your muscles and joints more resilient and more durable. But also we're not trying to make you a linebacker. Like there is a strong enough and we can get there multiple different ways. So if you think, Oh, I don't have a barbell. I don't do a deadlift, you know, conventionally, I don't do a back squat conventionally. Like that's okay. We can build strength in many different ways. And for your sport, would it be cool to do back squats? Yes, it would be beneficial. Do you have to? Absolutely not. There's a million different ways we can do this. So just think about like the, 
I love that you said that, man. It's a really interesting point because there's a lot of coaches out there that are like, nope, lift more, lift more. You need to get as strong as possible. You need to get big. Yeah, for certain sports. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply to rodeo. You got to have muscle, yes, but there's a certain line here. And, you know, taking methods from other strength and conditioning, what's the word I'm looking for? Avenues, no, like different worlds or like different yeah. sports and, and like they apply like in small ways yeah. right so there's lots of different things we take from other coaches and we learn from other places that we use but we don't use them verbatim right mm -hmm. we're using them little parts that work for our athletes and our clients so i don't know where i was going with that but yeah there is a strong enough level and you don't have to clang and bang super heavy weight to do that eccentrics isometric adding a tempo with weights that, you know, aren't that heavy, you're still going to increase your strength, increase your resiliency and your durability, going to move better. And the thing I like about, we talked about mobility a second, but I think about if we're moving slow, three seconds down, one, two, three, we are really, each part of that range of motion is strong throughout the whole thing. Cause you're, I feel like you're touching on it equally mm -hmm. rather than the full speed movements. If you know how to contract everything correctly, yes, you're being able to can be able to contract everything, but a lot of the beginner athletes, beginning level clients don't move very well in the beginning. And so just doing a squat, for example, just dropping to the bottom and coming up, well, you look at advanced to beginner, that beginner is going to have a lot more wobble and movement in their legs, their knees, their torso. They're only contracting a certain percentage of those muscles during the movement, right? So adding this tempo in is going to, you get to touch on all of those ranges of motion and the muscles and joints that are attached. What do you think about combining these things, eccentric and isometrics? Yeah. Um, again, like if you just looking at like you, you get to look at your load, like what you what you have available to you, I think is like probably the big you know thing on what what you're going to decide to do. But at the end of the day, it's it's increasing the time under tension. Like that's what we want to do. If, if we don't have enough weight to to be at the intensity we want, well, then we just draw out the time under tension. So adding more time is, is equivalent to adding more weight to the bar, or at least, you know, in, I don't, I'd have to brush up on and see like, you know, what the direct carryover is there, but it's at least it's close. You know, we can, we can increase that time under tension and get the same intensity that we need to drive adaptation. So if you're, you know, instead of adding an eight second eccentric, you know, I've got pretty short <laughs> legs. It would be pretty exhausting or, or crawling. It, yeah, it would be silly to, to go to an eight centric or eight second eccentric, sorry. But I could do like a three second eccentric and a three second hold at the bottom. That's yep. one of my favorite ways to warm up for squats is put even just an empty bar or, or some uh, 25s on the bar and do five seconds down five second hold at the bottom. That's 10 more seconds of time under tension per rep than what I would do, you know, just bouncing out of the bottom and, and standing back up. And so I can do that for five reps and I'm at a minute right there. And so then again, I'm getting proficient at the movement pattern. I'm kind of waking everything up. All of my muscles are firing the way I want to. I can check in with my body and see like, well, how does this feel? And then that can determine the intensity that I need to apply during my set that day. So, so combining them is, is I think the low hanging fruit as far as drawing out time under tension and increasing the intensity in your sets. Amen, dude. That was perfect. One of my favorite air squats variations to do is like a five, 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 one for five reps. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I love it. It lights you up. You burn, you're breathing hard. You're, what is happening? This is so slow, but I'm dying when I'm on the road. It's like one of my go-tos. Let's start. I'm not even going to add on to what you just said, bro, because that was perfect. Like <laughs> that you nailed that. Let's start talking about sports specifics here. How can we make isometrics specific to rodeo athletes? Bull riding, go. Yeah. I mean, again, it's just like it's about learning the movement patterns. And so uh, we already hinted on earlier, like you can apply it directly to your skill development. So like that's a bonus. But, you know, using the movement patterns, mimicking the movement patterns that you're going to use in the arena, in the gym, slowing it down and making sure that you are really, really good at those movement patterns. Because then once it's learned and you've established that mind muscle connection, you don't have to think about it when it's game time anymore. Mm -hmm. And so like now it's just, this is how my body is going to move. I'm confident in it. And I know that when I nod my head, it's going to do exactly what I need it to do. So like things like for bull riding would be uh, any hinge pattern, 
really. So Romanian deadlifts, deadlifts, good mornings, anything like that is going to, if you slow it down, is going to help fortify that hip hinge pattern and build up the posterior chain at the same time. So we're getting stronger, we're learning the movement pattern, and we're getting more proficient and confident in ourselves. Love that. I'm going to talk about timed event here real quick, just like roping. Something really simple that comes to my mind. You are constantly in internal and external rotation mm -hmm. when we're swinging the rope, getting into those banded or cable internal, external rotational holds, or you can come to just an internal, external rotation and hold there. Like however you want to get, I think more specifically, if we are talking about roping, if you are proficient at it, this version where you actually row and come your, to your upper arm is up at a, like a 90, 90 degree angle degree. to your torso. Yes. Yep. Would be really, really easy to throw in and something that I honestly think every person that is roping or throwing a rope of any kind, honestly, every athlete should be doing these internal, external rotations. They are, they were in my, my prehab this morning. Like they are the bread and butter of your shoulder. If you want to keep it really simple, but you can add these things in and make them more sport specific without making them doing the exact thing. And again, there are certain things like a markout, holding that markout, holding that that's an isometric hold. Rusty wrestling, if you got to like a like a pal off press position and you, or a pal off rotation and you rotated and held that rotation, that would be an isometric hold that's sport specific. Any kind of if you're a rodeo athlete, you need to be doing all of the entire hip flexor group. Mm -hmm. Adductors, abductors, hip flexors, glutes, all of it. You need to be doing isometric holds for everything. If you don't have exercises for that, check out our Instagrams, check out our YouTube. There are a billion demo videos there. And I know that Paul and I specifically have like hip mobility things on our Instagram that you guys can go check out and upper body as well. So all for the taking. What else we got? Do you got anything else to add to sports specific adaptation stuff? I don't think so, man. Like that's, that's really a, a solid place for anybody to start. And honestly, like you can progress through those and, and, and like you said, keep them in there too. Like, don't just progress on from them and, and forget about it because especially like the, in your roping example, you know, team ropers will complain about their shoulders hurting all the time. What's like, well, yeah, you're bouncing in and out of this position constantly because you're swinging a rope all day, every day. I don't know a team roper that doesn't practice every day. And then they're, they're competing usually multiple times a week if they have the opportunity to. So if you want to avoid that shoulder pain, like make sure you're doing these things all the time. Yeah. And every team rope or any kind of time event, usually the general thing that, that goes on is they overuse the living crap mm -hmm. out of that shoulder and they don't strengthen anything around it. And so then we run into really janky shoulders <laughs> and it's so simple, y'all. Internal external rotation among with a couple other exercises and you could have really strong, stable shoulders that don't give you any problems. But with all of this being said, we covered isometrics, we covered eccentric training, how you guys and girls can put these into your programs and how they can imp improve your performance in the arena. Start experimenting with these, y'all. Start trying these things out. If you have questions, reach out to us. But these are the small things that can really help you achieve your goals. So as always, we'd love to hear about any of your guys' experience with this or girls. Any questions, we got you. Reach out to us on social media, shoot us an email, whatever. Um, a big shout out to Rodeo Now app. I just got their ride of the week. Andrew's Rodeo is the bucking stock. More and more people are joining every day. It's so awesome to see and to see all of the stock and riders going on there. And, you know, they have, <clears throat> they love what we're doing. We love what they're doing. And they've just signed on with us for the next year. So, you guys will be seeing a lot of fun stuff coming from us in the Rodeo Now app. If you don't follow them, please follow them on Instagram. Um, download the app. It's free to download. There are platforms for both the fan and the rider and the stock contractor. So if you are interested in just watching Rodeo, learning about the stock you're getting on, or buying stock, bulls, horses, anything like that, that's the app for you. Check it out. Um, dude, I uh, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off another avenue here. I've been reading a couple, some like research I don't know, like weekly, not too often, but I came across a study and uh, Lane Norton is who I got it from. I've just been mm -hmm. reading his... His reps. Yeah, his reps. And if y'all like to read any kind of 
research. It's called biolane.com is his website, but Lane Norton does this really, really cool breakdown of studies and he makes it really digestible for the average human. What I mean by that is most research that you read is just filled with tons of scientific language as it should be. So what he does, he takes that language and explains what it means to mm. the common person. My favorite thing yeah. is like, they don't dilute it at all. Like you still get all of the information from, yes. the, from the actual study, but then like there's an addition, in addition to the abstract, like there's another intro portion. And then in addition to the, the research conclusion, like there's another like application portion, like what does this mean for you? And like, they really break it down really, really well. Yeah. It's, it's awesome, man. And he explains also like the testing groups, why it matters, what really, what this all means. Is it beneficial? Is it not? How and why? So real quick, this is, has nothing to do with what we talked about, but it was talking about the brain dopamine response to ultra processed foods, which I think is like a super hot topic in today's world. Processed foods forever have had the reputation of causing a, a huge dopamine dump, right? Which is why it makes you want more. Is that true or is it not? And we are about to find out. So research examined the effect of drinking an ultra processed milkshake, high in fat, high in sugar on the brain dopamine response in 61 healthy athlete, or athletes, <laughs> healthy adults to determine if there is a exaggerated dopamine response to that meal. And if the response is related to body fat levels. So what they did is they tested the consuming of this milkshake and the Whoa, what did they test? Research found the consuming the ultra processed milkshake to highly variable dopamine responses that weren't significantly higher than the baseline levels and weren't related to adiposity. I don't know what adiposity is. Do you? Fat uh, tissue storage. Okay. So what this means for you. So the current debate about the addictive nature of highly processed foods, especially those rich in high in fat and sugar, some evidence suggests that foods may activate similar reward pathways as addictive drugs and that this may be the driver of obesity. I've heard that many times. The findings of this study suggest that these foods may not have a significant impact on dopamine response regardless of body fat levels. It is likely that the tendency to overcome, I'm sorry, to overconsume these foods and their ability to override natural appetite regulation is the related factors than dopamine responses. So that's just the intro here. The whole purpose obviously is to find out if you eat processed foods. If we go to McDonald's, or drink a milkshake, is that going to make us have the same response as doing a hit of heroin or something like that, yeah. right? Because you like that's like one of the things you always hear like influencers say, like, it's worse Dude, than... Dude, it's yeah, worse than I crack. all the time. All it's the more, time. Like, sugar is addictive and all that stuff, but yeah, proceed. Wild. Okay, so let's talk about the participants, then we're talking about the procedures, how they set the study, the study up. Like I said, there's 61 healthy adults. They were selected from a wide range of BMI, so their body mass index categories, and they were eligible to participate if they were 18 to 45 years old. Their weight was stable, and they had no metabolic health concerns and were not taking medications that could impact the study. So I'm guessing kind of any kind of blood pressure or anything like medicine. So they were healthy people, a pretty wide range of ages, but also I think 18 to 45 is a good range to test because everyone's pretty much operating. I feel like it, you know, at a good level at the, through those ages. So this is a short term inpatient feeding study. So they can completed a baseline diet stabilization period for four days under free living conditions, followed by a four day inpatient stay at the metabolic ward. So they got to do their own thing for four days and they are controlled for four days. The second morning of the inpatient stay, the participants consumed that high fat milkshake and high sugar milkshake. This had 418 calories, 60% was fat. 18 grams of sugar after an overnight fast and completed pet scan to assess the dopamine responses to the meal they continued to control the diet for three to four days for days three and four and on day five they were given access to a buffet that they were able to eat freely from which research determined each par participant's energy consumption so there's a lot that goes into these studies <laughs> and how they set them up but it's important to know that how long they're testing for the amount of people that they're testing for because some of these studies that you look at test like five to ten people mm. and it's not or animals like that's and like a huge one and that's yeah. my favorite thing about lane is like he'll he'll break down a study too and like 
tell you whether or not like this is a viable thing that we can actually believe in because a lot of the like outlandish claims you see on Instagram and stuff like the studies of you know there's oh the chemicals in Coca-Cola or can literally kill you it's like well you know that I'm making up an, an example but like mm-hmm. a lot of times like that chemical is given to a mouse in a in a same quantity that would like be an overdose to a human so it's like well, of course this mouse had this <laughs> response because you just pumped him full of like some certain type of chemical or whatever. Exactly. And then some influencer on Instagram is going to take that and be like, this is killing you. And it's like, well, we're getting a fraction, like a tiny fraction of that same chemical. But yeah, anyway. Exactly. No, yeah, you're spot on. So what they measured again was the dopamine response levels in the brain, their hunger and food behaviors. They assess their hunger with the hunger and satiate. That is such a hard word. Satiety, satiety <laughs> and visual analog scales and disordered eating patterns were assessed with the Yale food addiction scale. So these scales that they use for hunger and food addiction, and then they use a body comp using a DEXA scan, which is pretty common. So what did they find? Here we go. Dopamine responses. Researchers found no increase in brain dopamine in response to the consumption of the milkshake. There was a large amount of variability in the response from one person to the next, which mm, again is interesting. a huge factor. There was also no relationship between brain dopamine response and any measure of anthropoth- anthropometrics or body composition. See what I mean about big words? All they had to say was body comp. There was a nearly, or there was a weak, nearly significant relationship between hunger at before consumption of the milkshake and brain dopamine response to the shake. And there was a significant relationship between the degree to which hunger was suppressed by the milkshake and brain dopamine response as well. That's interesting. So dopamine responders versus non-responders. So once they found out who responds and who doesn't, the research separated them into um, separate groups. Those who experience, I'm sorry, more likely to rate the milkshake as pleasant and were more likely to report wanting more of the milkshake. The researchers found no significant differences between the responders and non-responders. That's kind of means nothing really to me. It makes total, I mean, yeah, if you're more hungry and you drink the shake, you're going to like it Hmm. more and want more. So maybe it's the correlation between letting yourself get to that hunger level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Could correlate, could make you overeat those types of things yeah it's more satisfying your hunger craving rather than like dumping dopamine yeah yes okay energy consumption during the ad libitum feeding condition so research also researchers also found that consumption of energy from an ultra processed cookie was during the free feeding condition on day five was weakly correlated with the dopamine response but not total energy intake of the consumption of ultra processed foods so the, the cookie didn't matter. What's that last part? Weakly correlated with the brain response, but not total energy intake of the consumption of ultra processed foods. I don't understand what the last part means. Anyways, he breaks it down here. What did these mean? Oh, he's probably gonna help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> so the study suggests that ultra processed foods rich in fat and sugar do not elicit significant brain dopamine responses in healthy individuals free from any kind of history of eating disorders. Um, the findings also showed no impact on dopamine response or adiposity on brain dopamine response these findings are in conflict with previous research that has shown significant brain dopamine responses and animal studies so this study has an advantage to previous studies this is part of the reason i like what he does he tells you why it has an advantage in comparison due to the larger sample size and it was highly controlled inpatient feeding study the previous three studies all had under 20 participants where the current study had a sample of final sample of 50 The current study also included participants from a range of BMI levels. The previous studies use more limited samples um, to be like more specific on BMI ranges. Some of the differences in findings may also be explained by the different meals given. One study showed a significant dopamine response that was blunted in obese individuals and used 75 grams glucose load, which would have impacted glucose and insulin levels differently than the current study. So there are several limitations of the study. First, individuals individuals were excluded if they had a history of eating disorders. There's some evidence to suggest that individuals with binge eating disorders may have altered neurobiological responses to food. It's very interesting. Excluding that population from the study limits the findings from being applicable to those with eating disorders, which 
is the group that is most likely to be impacted by the altered brain dopamine responses to food. That's super interesting. So let's see here. Another limitation is a study that the milkshake was only 418 calories. Yeah. When it said that, I was like, that really isn't that much. It's like a mini. Yeah. Like if you go to Sonic and get the mini small one, like that's about what that is. Yeah. So those with higher energy leads or needs, meaning those with higher body mass may not have been satiated by the shake, which could have affected their brain dopamine response. A higher energy meal may have been contributed, may have contributed to more pronounced dopamine responses and standardizing the energy content of the shake may have been able to better assess differences in dopamine responses based on body weight. That's a very interesting point as well. Lastly, this study was a preprint, which means it has not yet undergone peer review. It is possible that the report may undergo some changes before publication. There's also the possibility it doesn't make it through the peer review. So how can we apply these? Like we said, <laughs> there's tons of debate about the addictive nature of foods, how they might contribute to obesity. Some evidence suggests that ultra processed, high fat, high sugar foods may be addictive, but this study does suggest otherwise. So best thing y'all can do is limit these foods from a health and you know, micronutrient standpoint. You're not getting any kind of vitamins, minerals from these foods, including some of these foods in your diet really doesn't seem to pose that much of a risk for addiction or dependency based on the existing research. But considering that flexible dieting strategies have been shown to improve dieting adherence, meaning you can stick to the diet, completely avoiding ultra processed foods may be counterproductive compared to including them into the diet moderation mm -hmm. in moderation. I love that ending because yeah. that keeps it real. So one of the things that kind of stands out to me there is that, you know, we, the, the, the warning or the caution that is like always thrown out, it's like, like, don't like avoid them at all costs because you're going to get addicted to them and then you're not going to be able to stop eating them is that this one suggests, and again, like it needs to go through peer review and, and publication and all that stuff, but it suggests that it's that that's not necessarily the case. And so then what I'm the, the conclusion that I'm drawing from this is people that often rely on these foods or lean towards these foods more frequently than eating whole foods or eating like a real meal, it's probably due to their hunger levels. So like if they're getting to a point where they're, you know, really hungry, like I need food right now and there's a shake shack across the street mm -hmm. and there's nothing else for, you know, blocks around, I'm probably going to choose that because I know that it's going to satisfy my hunger craving not so much like I'm addicted to this food. It's just that I've, I've neglected myself up until this point and allowed myself to get hungry. And now this is the thing that I'm going to be leaning on. That's and you're going to over lean on it. And you're going to over because you're, you're exactly. hungry. Yes. And then we get in a repetitions of that, that turns into a, a routine. Then we have a problem, mm -hmm. right? The flip side of this is people want to diet or change their eating habits and they go super hardcore and say, I will not have a processed thing. Gr granted, that would, by all means, that'd be badass. That'd be cool. Yeah, you'd be doing well, but that is not sustainable usually in our American life. And you're going to have times where you need processed foods. You're going to have to settle for them. What we're saying and what the study suggests is that not just cutting them out, leaving a little room is going to be a much better way to go about it. And you may be having a lot better luck at staying on your diet, quote unquote, or changing those eating habits or your routine by kind of having a little bit of grace with yourself and planning to have, you know, a little bit of processed foods because in America, dude, 90% of our food is, is processed and it's hard to avoid, you know, we do our best and when I travel, I'm eating processed food. That's how it is. But yeah. I know that it's not going to Yeah, I immediately me. thought of the airport. Like yep. <laughs> this whole example like makes me think of the airport because like what's what can I get on my 30 minute layover here? Like and I'm starving, I need food. What am I going to lean on? Probably what do you whatever's get? What do you closest. get? What do I get? I usually go to like the convenience store. Or like if I can find a restaurant and I have a long time to actually sit down and eat real food, uh, food yeah, I will. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's always option number 1. If I have time to go sit down and eat real food, like that's what I'm doing. But other than that, it's like the convenience store. You either grab a protein shake and maybe That's like some, some gummy bears or something. or something just because yeah. I know it's something I'm going to be able to snack on on the plane. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like it's not my preferred choice. I just know that it's going to get the job done. Mm -hmm. Same. I grab a protein shake, maybe a little jerky. I get Sour Patch Kids because I love mm -hmm. them and some water and roll on. I just 
Yeah. And then whenever I get where I'm going, I'm trying to find a good meal after that. But yeah. I thought that was an interesting study. It's a kind of a hot topic. Sorry, I kind of fumbled through the words there. You know, when you read in your head and it comes out so clear and then you start verbalizing it, like, what? <laughs> yeah. What am I saying? Uh, but hopefully that was interesting for y'all. We're going to try and start kind of doing these, these little overviews of studies for, for y'all. If they're interesting, they're interesting for us. I love reading through them. So we could probably do to... entire episodes on some We definitely could. Too. We definitely could. But y'all, thanks for listening. Do us a huge favor. Leave us a review. Share us on social media. Tag us. Any way that you can help us spread the word about what we're doing, we'd greatly appreciate it, and we appreciate all your support. And until next time, we'll catch you guys later. Lots of rodeo gear companies are coming out, but not all are equal. Beastmaster is really setting the bar when it comes to the equipment that is built for durability and designed for success in the arena. You guys can check them out at beastmasterrodeo.com. Use our discount code Champion Living twenty four. That's Champion Living two four. Going to save you a little bit at checkout. If you want to learn more about our coaches and program options, make sure to swing over to our website at www.championlivingfitness.com. You can fill out the Become an Athlete form to set up your free consultation and have all your questions answered by a coach.